Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. I want to take this opportunity to thank my friend Marco Villanius for the opportunity to come here this morning and speak to you about some topics that are very close to my heart, and I think they're close to the heart of just about everyone in this room, because what we are facing is the future in a complex world, and if futureology or future studies is about anything, it's about trends and the end of a trend. How do you get from one to the other? And that's what I want to speak about in this talk this morning, because in the course of trying to understand more deeply those questions of trends and the end of trends, we will encounter extreme events, we will encounter complexity, we will encounter mass psychology, and a couple of other things along the way. So uh, to begin, let me show you some historical trends. Here you see some trends from the past, uh, from very long trend, over 100 million years, from beginning to end, to very short trends associated with things like trends in popular culture. I used here vampire mania. You probably remember a few years ago, there was a sort of a, a fashion, a fad, if you like, for films about vampires and clothing about vampires and movies and all sorts of vampire uh, focus. And it lasted a year or two or three, and then something else replaced it. Now, <clears throat> the point of this list, and it could go on essentially forever, is not the actual trends that I've put up here themselves, but the fact that there were trends and they always end. They always come to an end. And the futurologist, in some ways, is in the business of trying to answer the question, whatever the current trend is, how long is it going to last? And also, what will replace it? So I'll certainly address the first question. But it's interesting that in the, uh, let's say, non-professional futures business, one of the major tools that people use to try and forecast, if you like, the future is called trend following. And trend following essentially says the current trend, whatever it is, is going to continue and tomorrow will be just like today except a little better or a little worse but no major change, no discontinuous shocking kind of change. And the f reason people use this trend following is because it's almost always correct. Uh, it has zero information content. You don't need to hire a futurologist to do this for you. But the fact is you'll almost be correct. So let's have a look at why. Here you see a stylized time series chart where the time is actually along the X axis here. And the trend or the, val the level of the trend is along the vertical axis. And you see the dashed line is how the trend is proceeding. And on this chart, if you look at the time moments, I've focused on three of them here. I call them A, B, and C, not very imaginatively, but it works. And these are, if you would pick a point in time at random, just close your eyes and focus on a single point and say, how will this trend look in the next moment? Unless you happen to have accidentally picked one of those three points, your answer would be a trend follower's answer. Tomorrow will be just like today, except a little better if the trend is moving up, and a little worse if the trend is moving down. And you'll be correct almost all the time, because the number of points where you're not correct, A, B, and C, they form a microscopically small set in the collection of all points. So if you pick something at random, you have probability zero that the point you'll pick is A, B, or C. That's a mathematical fact. Probability zero doesn't mean impossible, it means probability zero. <laughs> so trend follower is almost always correct except when they're not. But when they're not, that's the most interesting point. A, B, and C. What's really interesting is not the trend. What's interesting is when it's going to end and how it's going to end. 
And you should be willing to pay a lot of money for somebody who can tell you where those points A, B, and C are because that's not easy. That's not easy at all. They're very rare in the set of all possible points. So our, my talk now is really about focusing on events, whether they're extreme events or not, because those points A, B, and C, they are what in the mathematical terminology are called critical points. And all the other points are called ordinary points for good reason. And the critical points are where the current trend is flipping to its opposite. So let's start and look at events themselves to begin with. So human events, or events in general, are, but mostly human events, they're a combination of two factors. I call them here chance and necessity, or uh, random triggers and a context. A context is what specifies the set of all possible next events. The random trigger is what picks out from that set of all possibilities what you actually get. And I emphasize the point that it's a random trigger. It's not something that can be forecast or predicted. And for that reason, human events also cannot be forecast and predicted in the same way that you would try and predict the position of a planet or some other uh, phenomena in physics. The random trigger is the key element that basically tells you this is what you get from that set of possibilities. But the set of possibilities are not all equally likely. So think about that context. I want to focus on the context. Think about it as a kind of landscape with hills and valleys and flat plateaus and so on. And if you happen to be sitting currently at a flat plateau, like a tabletop, and if you're not near the edge, then even a big random push isn't going to change things much. You're going to still be on that tabletop. But if that tabletop morphs into a mountain peak and you get a random shove in one direction or another, chances are very high you're going to be pushed off that peak and you're going to collapse down into one of the valleys. And so uh, the fact that the context is not static, it's always dynamically shifting, you might think that you're on a flat plateau and that plateau may be morphing into a mountain peak and you might not even notice it. You might not even notice it until you crash. So it's very important to try and understand how that landscape of events, the context, how that landscape changes over the course of time. How does it shift? And in my work over the last several years, I've been studying this question and I've identified what I think are the two of the main drivers, if you like, in the dynamics of this shifting landscape. And one of those drivers has to do with complexity, and one of them has to do with mass psychology. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, the, the first one about complexity is involves not so much the absolute complexity of something, as we'll see in a moment, but it has to do more with the relative complexity of the in, of two, two or more systems in interaction, if you like. Okay, so let's, let's go to that next one. And now, Marku has given you a very good brief introduction to this fantastic book by Joseph Tainter, The Collapse of Complex Societies. But I want to uh, re emphasize what Marku said. Tainter looked at the um, civilizations that have existed in the past and asked the question, why did they disappear? Why don't we see them anymore? What happened to them? And was there a common reason why they disappeared? Or was each case a particular special case all its own? And what Tainter discovered was, yes, there is a common reason. And that common reason is, I'll call it complexity overload. And what happens to societies is that they get into a situation where they always are facing problems. Every society, every civilization faces problems that have to be solved for them to continue. And the default method of solution is to create 
a new structure whose mission is to specifically address that problem. And then the next problem comes. And what happens then? Well, you create another structure whose business is to solve that problem, and so on. And eventually, you are in a situation where you have so many structures that your resources are all consumed in maintaining this existing process. So there's no resources left for the next problem. And what happens, the next problem comes along and it just gets given out to one of the parts of the existing system and it's given out to a, a solution that was never created to solve that kind of problem. And so either it doesn't get solved or even more common and worse is that they, you try and solve it and you make a mess of it. Uh, and so eventually the complexity overload reaches a point where the whole system crashes off the edge. That's the idea. And that's what happened to all civilizations from the past. And I'm sorry to have to say it will probably happen to our civilization too because that's the pattern. That's the, the structure of complex systems, a social system. But it doesn't have to happen so soon. Maybe we can be like the dinosaurs and it will last 130 million years uh, where we have a long way to go to get to that point. But the dinosaurs made it and maybe we can get there too. We'll see. Now, um, so my take on Tater, Tainter's book, he only focused in his book on a single system, the, the, the society or the civilization. I looked at this problem from a little bit more modern uh, complexity science point of view and said, well, all of our systems, they're really composed, if you look at the transportation system, the communication system, or whatever, they're composed of several subsystems that are in interaction with each other. And each of those subsystems has its own level of complexity, and they interact, and so as long as the Level, just imagine two subsystems. Think about the financial services sector and the regulators. The financial services sector has its own level of complexity and the regulators have their level of complexity. Now, as long as those two levels of complexity are approximately equal, then everything is more or less fine. You don't have too much stress. But as one of the systems complexity develops and, and it's a dynamic process, and the other one doesn't keep up, then a gap emerges or a mismatch. And, it, and if you let that mismatch continue to unfold, you get a much more stress in the system. And if you can't relieve that stress, relieve that stress, you're going to have trouble. It's like stretching a rubber band. Suppose you start stretching a rubber band. You can feel the tension in your arms of the mismatch between one end and the other. And if you continue to stress, stretch, the eventually it, 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 nature will step in and say, well, you haven't relieved this tension, so I'll have to do it for you. And nature's way is usually not very pretty because nature doesn't care very much about us. And as a consequence, the rubber band breaks, you have a crash. And that's what happens in uh, almost all complex systems. You get crashes because tensions build up and they don't get relieved. Okay. So uh, let, let's, here's an example. Oops, sorry, go back, go back one. Yeah. Okay, here's just an example of a few uh, complexity mismatches. Uh, and I'm not going to read them out to you. You can read a lot better than me anyway. So uh, the point is, they're all over the place. As soon as you start think thinking in these terms, every page of the newspaper is filled with another complexity mismatch, or the electronic digital newspaper, if you like. So this is one of the drivers of the landscape of events, is complexity mismatches. And that complexity mismatch, they determine the, the valleys around the mountain peak and the size of the valleys that you might fall into. They don't tell you what 
you're actually going to fall into. It just says these are the possibilities, and not all of them are the same. So now we go to, sorry, uh, sorry, this, this, I got things reversed. Complexity mismatch determines the shape of the landscape, whether you're on a uh, plateau or mountaintop or whatever. But it doesn't tell you about the valleys. The second driver tells you about the valleys. The second driver is mass psychology, what I call the mood of a population. And the mood of a population is simply the collective feeling of the population has about its future. Is the group positive about the future, optimistic, looking forward to the future, or are they pessimistic, fearing the future rather than welcoming it? And of course, this is on many time scales. Because so if I if you ask you what what's your view of the future, uh, you know, the right answer to that question is what future. Uh, or more accurately, which future? Because you may have a very different view if you're talking about tomorrow versus next year versus next decade. So you have to calibrate the question to suit the time scale of what you're interested in. And so this social mood I've discovered, and I wrote a book about this a few years ago called Mood Matters, it biases the kind of events that you can expect to see. It doesn't determine them. It just biases them. It says that if you're in a positive, optimistic mood about the future, the type of events that you can expect to see, you no know guarantees here, but it's like weather forecasting, you no know guarantees, but this is what you can expect to see, is events that you would label happy, joining, welcoming, optimistic, and so on. And the opposite would be if you're in a negative mood. Then instead of Joining, you get separating type events. Instead of, of globalizing, you get localizing. Instead of happy, you get sad, and so on. So this is the character of the events. And that mass psychology is the factor that creates these valleys that you might fall into if you get pushed off the mountain peak. The size of those valleys is the is the uh, uh, domain, if you like, of the psychology. So um, our question comes down at this point to how do you measure these things? How do you measure the complexity or the complexity mismatches? And how do you measure the social mood? And the, uh, in each case, there's more than one option. So I'm going to just give you the, the short story right now. For complexity mismatches, for the complexity of a system, in my book, X Events, I used a very simple measure. And there are about 37 others in the literature. But it's one, this is one that uh, seems to work. And that is a system's complexity is the number of independent decisions that it has available to make at a given point in time the degrees of freedom that the system has to act. And the more degrees of freedom that you have to act, the more complex you are. Um, now, the question of how to measure social mood, again, a very simple and pretty effective measure, but by no means the only one, is to just, in a given population, if you want to know how the population as a whole feels about the future, just look at the financial markets. Look at the S&P 500, or <clears throat> the um, um, maybe there's 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 a financial market in Finland too. I can't remember its name now, but the, I know it exists. And you can look at their index and say this is a reflection of the bets that people are making about the future, on all time scales. And it's not just vague personal opinions or, public, or questionnaires or surveys. It's bets that are people are making with something they actually care about, namely hard cash. And so what you end up with is a measure of, financial, uh, the fin of um, social mood. And this picture that you see up on the screen right now is just an illustration of this. It shows the social mood, the financial indices uh, for markets in the Middle East and the United States, the three of the main players in the Middle East, the Arabian players, if you like, measured by Jordan. Excuse me, I changed the headset for you. There's people in the back who can't hear. 
Yeah, I, I don't know what, there's some kind of feedback in this mic. Yes, we changed it. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, we have a small technical interruption here. I hope the system won't collapse. <laughs> okay. Can you all hear me now? No? How about now? Not yet? How about now? No? Now? How, can you hear me in the back? Okay. All right. So turn this one off. Okay, this is better now. Now, are, are we all on the same page now? No, oh. <laughs> With pleasure. <laughs> nothing, I like nothing I like better than being on stage, you know that. Okay, so now here's this uh, graphic showing major events in the Middle East and we're showing the social mood in the USA in the uh, Israeli area, the market in Tel Aviv, and the market in the Arab, Arabic area in Jordan. And what you see, because uh, uh, I know in the back you probably can't see this chart anyway, and it's not important. What's important is that in this uh, event, in these events, the when the markets, when the social mood is positive, you tend to get events in the Middle East that you would uh, label as nice, good, positive events. Most people would label them that way anyway. And when the mood goes negative and people fearing the future, then you get just the opposite. And so on here I've marked some of the events. UN authorizes war on Iraq. US declares war on Iraq. Second Intifada begins and so on. September 11th and so on. So the things that are negative happen at a time when the social mood is negative and vice versa. The, the correlation is very high between them. So those are the two factors that create the context of events that give a bias to the kind of things that we can expect to see happen in the future. And so, I call these changes of trend, those points that I had A, B, and C before, where the trend changes, especially if it changes very rapidly. Those points are, I mentioned earlier, they're very rare, and they're surprising as a consequence to almost everyone, but even more importantly, when they happen, especially if they happen rapidly, they have dramatic impact. Dramatic impacts. Usually negative impacts. Usually they involve a loss of life, loss of money, loss of uh, emotional security, and so on. Lots of things that we value and, and actually would prefer to preserve, they get blown away by these extreme events. And that's in the short term, and that's also actually not so nice. And here, here are a few examples where you would see these as problems. But in fact, I would like to convince you that they're, they're problems only in the short term. In the longer term perspective, they're opportunities. And why are they opportunities? Because these extreme events are necessary to clear out existing structures that are no longer serving a useful purpose. And usually those structures are the structures that are controlled by what I'll call the power structure in a social system. And in Western societies, that's usually the governments and the banks. And the last thing in the world governments and banks want is change, especially any meaningful change because they're the big beneficiaries of the system as it currently stands. And so the only way that those power structures can be pushed aside is through what one might call a kind of force majeure, forces that they cannot resist. 
like the, dino the asteroid that blew away the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. It was bad news for the dinosaurs, no question about that. But it was very good news for us because without that asteroid, we wouldn't be here today having this nice conference. Uh, and these extreme events, by clearing out all of the rubbish that has outlived its usefulness, opens up new niches niches for new products, new services, new uh, structures that would not have been possible by just doing cosmetic changes around the edges of existing systems. They need to be destroyed in general. Now that's not a very happy message for most people, uh, especially for the ones, ones who uh, are the uh, victims. But of course they're the victims not because uh, they're, they're partly they're the victims because they didn't prepare for it. Uh, and so, but my message really is that the idea of what we think of as human progress is something that is, uh, let's see, let me yeah, keep clicking, keep clicking. One more, that's it, stop there. This is a picture that basically summarizes everything that I've said so far. It's a kind of cycle of human progress. And I would make the claim that if you want to have human progress, you must allow to have extreme events. They are the drivers of human progress. And let me just start at the beginning of this diagram. Here's the regular points, the ordinary points. You get complexity, mismatch, social mood, biases, and so on which change the context and take you to one of those critical points, A, B, or C. When we're at one of those points, then a random shock, a trigger, picks out an event, an X event, extreme event, short-term destruction, that is the consequence of one of those events, but that destruction also gets rid of stuff that doesn't need to be there. And then you get what I call here rebirth a long-term reconfiguration of the social structure. A new order of things, if you like. And there, that from there, you just go back to the beginning. Except it's not the beginning. There's one thing misleading about this picture. And what's misleading is that it's not a circle. It's, a, it's like a helix. It's a spiral. And what happens, if you're lucky, the spiral goes up, and that's what we call progress. But if you're unlucky, if it might go down also. And that's what we call regress. And that's a story. Progress versus regress is a story all of its own. And I don't want to get into that because I think it's a very tricky business. And the more you think about it, the more shadowy it becomes to be, even make a statement of what you mean by progress. Uh, one man's progress is the next person's regress and vice versa. But in any case, this is the uh, system theoretic picture. And here are a few takeaways from it. First of all, complexity kills. Too much complexity is definitely even worse than not enough complexity. Secondly, and I said this earlier, human events cannot be forecast or predicted in the way that we usually think about prediction. It, they may be anticipated, but not predicted. Third, the social mood, the mass psychology, has a strong biasing factor in what you can expect to see. And I know I use the word bias advisedly. It's not a guarantee. It just pushes you in one direction as opposed to another. And finally, the major conclusion here, this is the prosperity part of the title of this talk, is that these extreme events are necessary for rebirth. Without them, you won't have any rebirth. You'll just have a continuation of the status quo, essentially. So, now, I want to uh, conclude this talk with a short advertisement. Uh, recently, I decided to translate these ideas into this, of this talk into tangible terms, operational terms, and consequently formed a company called X Events Dynamics. 
And the mission of the company is really to give counsel and advice to corporations, government agencies, high net worth individuals, low net worth individuals, like most of us here, uh, on the issues of how to understand, anticipate, and manage extreme events. Because every single one of us in this room, we have things that we could imagine that might happen in our life that we would like to be able to manage or even understand and anticipate. And they are the kinds of things that if they do happen, they could turn our lives upside down. This is one of the reasons we take out insurance, is exactly because of these types of events. And the same thing applies at levels of countries, at the levels of organizations, corporations, uh, government agencies, and whatever. Every organization has things about that could happen in the future that they're afraid of because if they happen, it's going to blow them out, out of the water. And so our company, Xevent Dynamics, has tools that have been developed over the last several years to try and help people in such situations prepare for their event. For the, the, we're, we're not in the business of creating new extreme events for you to worry about. We're in the business of saying, what is it you're worried about and how can we help you? Uh, but we're also not in the business of doing what, well, because most organizations already are doing something. They know the things that they're afraid of and they're doing something in-house, in if you like, to try and act today to build a cushion against, a protection against that happening and, and the, against destroying them. Because the first rule of survival is to survive. After that, you can worry about what to, what to do next. And so, um, but one thing that I know from lots of conversations with people in organizations is what they are doing to protect themselves is not at all the kind of things that X event dynamics would tell them about. We will well, I'll tell them about the kind of things that we're talking about here today, not about uh, scenario construction or about uh, extreme event statistics and probability. I mean, after all, you can't use statistics and probability if you're talking about an event that never happened before. There's no data. You have to do something else. So we're going to, we're the something else company. Um, Okay, so now that was my advertisement. Anybody who wants to talk to me about that, please just see me at the coffee break or tomorrow or wherever. Um, so here's the last thing, advertisement. <laughs> this is like a TV show, you know, you have to have an advertisement at the end. And here are some books that I did that the first one, X Events, has to do with complexity mismatches. The second one, Mood Matters, has to do with uh, social mood. And finally, as a bonus, the last one, Confronting Complexity, which is basically an update of those two previous books and adding a third topic, which I didn't talk about here, Resilience. And you can find a copy of that book out on the table in the uh, coffee room. And, but, but have a look, thumb through it, but don't take it away because it's the only one that I have right now. <laughs> Uh, but there's some papers there that can tell you more about it next to the book. So with that, I hope that you can still hear me in the back. Now it's time for me to say thank you for your attention. And uh, what, if you have questions, maybe we can do it in the, in the coffee room. Okay, thank you.